This video, which is part of the CCT routing and switching curriculum, is titled Differentiating Layer 2 Technologies. My name is Keith Bogart, and I will be your instructor for this video. As far as the video overview is concerned, in Section 3.0 of the CCT routing and switching, it has this on the blueprint. It says, differentiate between these Layer 2 technologies, then it lists these off from Ethernet down to optical and etc. Now, right here, right off the bat, I have a problem with this bullet point. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about this in about 30 seconds. Namely, that some of the things listed on here are not Layer 2 technologies, specifically DSL and optical. As you learn about networking technology, I don't know as you're watching these videos if you've done any studying of the OSI model yet. Um, but in the OSI model, you have the whole, everything that could be done in networking broken up into seven different functional layers, okay? Layer one is called the physical layer. This means everything having to do with electrical impulses, you know, how do we represent a one and zero via electricity? Or how do we represent it via light? What's the cable look like? How much, how, how thick is it? How many wires should it be? How long should it be? Um, all that stuff is called layer one or the physical layer. And that is where DSL and optical reside. Layer two is not that. So what is layer two? So in the OSI model, layer two is called the data link layer. So physical layers, layer one, layer two is the data link layer. And the data link layer is actually subdividable into two sublayers. The LLC sublayer, which stands for the logical link control, and the MAC sublayer. So let's look at the MAC sublayer first real quickly. So we know that layer one is defining the cable, what's in the cable, how ones and zeros will be actually physically represented, be either laser light or electricity or radio frequencies or something like that. Well, the MAC sublayer says, okay, now that we have all that taken care of, the MAC sublayer says things like, how do I know when I can access the cable? Like, how do I know when it's my turn? as opposed to when I should wait if somebody else is talking? Or should I even be concerned about that? Um, when I access the cable, when I put the data on there, do I need to address it in such a way that the destination knows that it's for them? Or do I not care about that? If I do need to address it, what does that address look like? How big should it be? What do the bits represent in that address? When something is coming in on the cable, how do I know it's for me? All of that is stuff that the MAC sublayer is responsible for. So if there is a protocol that does that, if someone develops a protocol that answers questions like, how do you know when you can talk on the cable? How do you know when you should stop talking? When you get something on the cable, how do you identify that it's for you? When you transmit something on the cable, how do you identify specifically who it's for? If the protocol answers those types of questions, that is a layer two protocol or DSL and optical, they don't answer those questions. They're physical layer stuff. They're not concerned with that stuff. Similarly, at the data link layer, we have the logical link control sublayer, which is stuff, for example, like, okay, we know that one layer up at the networking layer, there's a lot of protocols that reside at the networking layer. There's IP version four, IP version six, Apple talk, IPX, all kinds of stuff. So, here we are at the physical layer and we got bzz, 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 bzz. we got electricity coming in at different voltages representing ones and zeros, ones and zeros. Now, the MAC sublayer looks at those ones and zeros and ones and zeros and says, okay, um, according to the protocol that I run, according to the rules that I follow, uh, this first set of ones and zeros represents the destination address. Is that my address? Oh, yes it is, that's my address. Okay, great, I'm gonna start picking this up. Okay, now all the ones and zeros stop. Okay, I have my frame. Here's my frame, I know it's for me. Now the next question this thing says is, okay, I'm gonna pass this up to the LLC sublayer. Max sublayer says, I'm done. I know this is for me, I got it all, I verified it's okay, it's not messed up in some way. And by the way, that's also something the max sublayer does. Error checking. Are any of these ones and zeros screwed up from the time that they were transmitted by the sender? Not gonna talk about how it does that, but that's a responsibility of the MAC sublayer. So the MAC sublayer says, my job is done. Hey, LLC sublayer, 
here's the frame. Here's all the ones and bits I picked up. It's for us. It's okay. Here you go. So the LLC sublayer gets it and says, okay, I know my job is I need to pass it upstream, but I got a lot of stuff up there. I got IPv4 that might be waiting for something, IPv6, Apple Talk, IPX, other things. The LLC sublayer is responsible for figuring out how do I send it to IPv4? How do I send it to IPv6? Whatever is up there at the next layer, at the networking layer, how do I get it to the appropriate protocol up there? And similarly, all these protocols, you know, in your laptop, if you're running IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time, which these days you probably are, even if you're not aware of it, that means your laptop's processor is creating, IP, is creating data with IPv4 addresses, creating data with IPv6 addresses, and all that stuff is going down to your Ethernet NIC card. Well, it's the LLC sublayer that's responsible for grabbing all that stuff so the NIC card can talk to layer three. That's the responsibility of LLC. So once again, if a protocol knows how to do that, that is a layer two protocol. Once again, DSL and optical, they don't know how to do that. They're physical layer stuff. And typically we say that devices that are used at the data link layer are switches and bridges. But really, anything with a NIC card operates at the data link layer. Really, you can't connect to a network without operating at the data link layer. <laughs> Your laptop operates at the data link layer. A router operates at the data link layer. A Wi-Fi access point operates at the data link layer. If you're not touching the data link layer, you have no connectivity to the physical layer. And if you have no connectivity to the physical layer, you're not networking. You're not talking to anybody. So let's differentiate between these various different layer two protocols. So I have included on here the actual real true layer two protocols. Notice that in the bullet point, even though it mentions serial and optical and uh, DSL, those are not layer two protocols. So I'm not including them in my chart right here. So let me zoom in on this here and let's just go through each one of these things as a bullet point so we can sort of differentiate between them. Okay, so the true layer two protocols, all the ones I could come up with off the top of my head were the various flavors of ethernet, asynchronous transfer mode, that's ATM, integrated services, digital network, that's ISDN, frame relay, the point-to-point -point protocol, PPP, and the high-level data link control protocol, or HDLC. Now these are all things that answer those various questions. All these protocols I wrote here answer the questions of how do I know when it's my turn to go? When something comes in off the wire, how do I know if it's for me? When I'm putting something on the wire, do I need to address it to the destination? And if so, how do I do that? All these protocols answer those questions. So how are they different from each other? Well, in a variety of ways. Number one, some of these protocols are used in local area networks. They're specifically designed to be used between devices that are fairly close in proximity to each other. So that is ethernet, fast ethernet, and gigabit ethernet. Now there are, gigabit ethernet can blur the lines because if you're doing gigabit ethernet over fiber optic cabling, you can actually have that go for quite a bit of distance. So gigabit ethernet could potentially be used in WANs as well. But usually when we're thinking of ethernet, we're thinking of LANs, we're not thinking of WANs. Now what about WANs? In other words, what layer two protocols are designed to operate across vast distances, hundreds or thousands of miles? That would be everything else. So all these layer two protocols here were specifically designed to operate across wide area networks. Broadcast based, what does that mean? Some of these protocols were designed around this assumption. They were designed around the assumption that when I put data on a wire, there are gonna be many potential devices connected to the same wire as me. Which means that when I put data on the wire, I have to address that data. I have to put some sort of destination address so that even though everybody's gonna see it, only the guy I actually wanna pick it up will pick it up. There's nothing I can do to prevent everybody from seeing it. We're all connected to the same wire. 
but only the guy who needs it is actually going to pay attention to it. That is called broadcast based. Right? For example, when you and a bunch of your friends get into a room and you all start talking together, that's broadcast based. Even if you're the only one talking, everybody's going to hear you. You can't help that. So all the flavors of Ethernet were designed around broadcast based networks, which means Ethernet needs to specifically address its data to the destination device that it's going to. Because we want to make sure that people who don't need it don't pick it up and listen to it. These other protocols from ATM all the way down to HDLC are what's called point to point based protocols, which means that this protocol has the assumption that when I put data on the wire, it can only go one place. There's not multiple destinations on this wire. When I put data on the wire, there's only one place it can go to at the other end. ATM, ISDN, Frame Relay, PPP, and HDLC are all like that. Now, as you learn about Frame Relay, that's a little bit debatable, but Frame Relay is definitely not broadcast based. There is no way to put a Frame Relay frame on a wire and have multiple devices see that one single Frame Relay frame. Hence, it is not broadcast based. Requires setup signaling. What's that referring to? Okay, so some of these protocols are sort of like when you pick up the phone, right? Now, if you're in the White House and you've got the red phone in front of you and you pick it up, you don't have to dial a number. You are automatically connected to the Pentagon, right? But at your house, that's not the case. When you pick up that phone, it's not going anywhere until you type in some digits, which means you are sending signaling information. You're telling the telephone company via those digits you're punching in, this is the remote destination, in this case, telephone number, that I want to talk to. And then the telephone company sets up a path or what we call a circuit between you and the remote telephone, and now you can talk across that line. But when you first pick up the phone, there's no circuit established. You have to send some sort of signaling information to say, this is where I want the circuit to end. So, ATM, if you're using what's called switched virtual circuits, that's what SVC stands for, is like that. ISDN is definitely like that. ISDN uses like a phone number. Frame relay can also be set up with something called switched virtual circuits. And PPP was designed around the assumption that it could go multiple places, but you have to signal first and say where you want to go. As opposed to all of the flavors of Ethernet are always on, right? When you put an Ethernet frame on the wire, you don't have to first say, hey, knock, 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 wire, are you awake? Come on, I need to use you. You don't have to do that. The wire is always there, it's always available. You can immediately put your data on that wire. So all flavors of Ethernet are like that. If you're using what's called a permanent virtual circuit, which means a circuit that's always up, like that red phone connecting the White House to the Pentagon, that would be a permanent virtual circuit. It's always available, it's always up, and it always ties two devices together that's always available. So ATM and frame relay when using permanent virtual circuits is always on. Doesn't need any signaling. HDLC was desi designed around the assumption that the circuit it's riding across is always up. HDLC and doesn't have any kind of addressing, right? When you put data inside of an HDLC header, there's no layer to address there. HDLC says, hey, why do I need to address it? It can only go to one person. At the other end of the line, there's just one person there. And then lastly, some of these layer two, some of these specifications, for example, all the flavors of Ethernet, as well as ATM and ISDN, not only reside at layer two of the OSI model, they also reside at layer one of the OSI model. For example, if you open up an Ethernet document, you'll see in there not only answers to the questions that layer two has, which is, how do I know when I can go? How do I know when I should stop talking? When something comes in, how do I know it's for me? Those are all layer two questions. But the Ethernet document also answers questions like, what does the cable look like? Does it use copper? How many strands of copper? How long can the cable be? What kind of voltage is used for one? What's used for a zero? That's all layer one stuff. So all the flavors of Ethernet in addition to ATM and ISDN 
also specify layer one as well as layer two. And that's a pretty good breakdown there of differentiating between our layer two protocols.